Welcome to Rapid Worship Center. We're so excited that you're here. My name's Shayna. I'm our worship leader. You will stand on up with us. We're going to start this morning with Little Drummer Boy.
Doesn't make much sense. Trust in me. 
Praise Jesus. You may be seated. My name is Pastor Jason Green. I'm the care director here, and I'm so excited that you just decided to join us for our worship experience today. If you're a guest, I just want to extend you a special welcome and say thank you so much for being here. If you've not filled out your Connect card, please feel free to go ahead and do so. If you're a guest and you say, well, I didn't get one of those cards coming in, I don't know anything about it, please just make sure at some point you visit our VIP table in the foyer because we have a gift for you. And of course, we will ask you to fill out this card because it is our prayer card as well. So just make sure you hit that VIP table um, if you were not able to when you came in. And as those who are going to receive the offering come forward, you'll be able to put your connect cards in the buckets when they fail. I do want to tell our guests, please don't feel obligated to give today. We understand that you need to get to know us first. You know, in the book of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus, he begins to talk about a man who builds his house on a rock versus a man who builds his house on the sand. And he's talking about those who are wise versus those who are not wise. You know, just because we became believers, just because at some point we accept Christ, that doesn't automatically make us wise. Wisdom is a lifestyle. And as Jesus talks about this solid foundation, there's certain things in our life that tether us to that foundation, that, that lifestyle. Obeying the Word, knowing the Word, living it out. One of those things that tethers us is, is tithing. Well, how does that do so? Because when you're obedient in tithing, what you're doing is you're tethering your financial life to wisdom. You know, I have a mortgage coming up this week. i got to buy groceries. I'm sure there's a couple other expenditures that I've already blocked out of my mind. <laughs> they just keep coming at me. 
get bills for this, bills for that. I get bills from the government because I took a breath. These bills just keep coming in. It can be kind of chaotic at some point. See, when I tithe and I tether myself to that rock, it brings stability to my financial life. I don't know how it works. It's spiritual, but it brings stability. So think about that today as you give your tithes and offerings. And I just thank you so much for your giving. If you'll turn your attention to the screens. It's the Sunday morning show that keeps you in the know. It's just around the bend. Hey, good morning, church, and welcome to our worship experience this morning. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing, man? I'm doing wonderful. How about yourself? Fantastic. Hey, we want to give a big shout out to all those who helped out with the Christmas parade. Awesome time there downtown under the lights this year. It was awesome. Hey, we don't want you to miss a thing at this busy time of year, right? So go ahead and pick up a flyer, a uh, Christmas flyer. If you don't have it, we don't want you to miss anything. Like our big event coming up on December 21st. That's a Saturday night, 7 o'clock, and then our regular service times on Sunday, 3, 8.30, 10, and 11.30. Ben? Uh, next up, we're going to go ahead and talk about December 25th, Christmas. Uh, we also have January 1st. Both of these fall on Wednesdays this year, so there will not be a Wednesday night Ford service. Stay home, be with your families. That's it, what we want. And enjoy. Also, for our big event, we need volunteers to dress up as elves to help in different areas of the church to make it an awesome experience for those visiting for, with us for the first time. That'll wrap our show for this week. Join us next time as we take you just around the bend. everybody doing today? If you're a guest, we just want to welcome you to our Sunday morning worship experience. Uh, I hope you've been made to feel welcome. We want to encourage you to fill out the connection card. If you haven't done so, at the end of the service, you can turn it in to the VIP table that's in the foyer. And we want to bless you with a gift as you leave. And thank you for coming and worshiping with us today. A lot of places you could have gone, but you've come here. Uh, if you're watching online or you watch later on YouTube or the delayed uh, of the broadcast, uh, I would ask you just to make a comment, uh, check in with us, uh, just so we will know that you are watching out there. We'd appreciate that. It's always an encouragement. Uh, I want to remind you, next week is the big event, okay? Uh, we, we've done a lot of preparation. Uh, we have 725 names, courtesy of you people that you know that don't know Jesus, and I've been praying over those 725 names every day. So I want you to know that I'm doing my part, and I want you to do your part. Make sure you get in touch with them this week. Hand them my invitation card. It's better to do it in person rather than just mailing it to them. 82% uh, of the people that 
come to church for the first time or personally invited. So I want to encourage you to do this. We've gone to a lot of work, effort, expense uh, in order to, to, to create a great event next weekend. They're going to hear the gospel, and we're believing that lives are going to change. Uh, so thank you so much. Now, this morning we're just going to continue on the series, A Home for Christmas, Building a Family that Lasts. And, you know, uh, last week we looked at right priorities, and, you know, I began with this. You know, and I think it's so important that people don't enter into marriage lightly. You know, uh, I like what one pastor said, you need to become the one you're looking for is, look, uh, is looking for, and that's a good rule of thumb. You, you need to become what you want to marry uh, before you ever get married, and it's important that if, if you are a believer that you enter into that relationship with someone who loves Jesus. It's important that we have the right vertical relationship with God so we can have the right horizontal relationship with each other. And also, we want to build our lives on the cornerstone of Christ as individuals and build our life on the foundation of God's Word. So when we come together, you know, we've got a marriage that's going to stand forever because, you know, it's going to be based on the Word of God, His promises. And, you know, the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit is going to get involved in that marriage. And you're going to walk together by faith no, no matter what you face in life. Jesus said... Any person that hears my words and then follows my teaching or does my teaching, he's a wise man, okay? And they're building their house, their life, their home on a rock. And when the storms of life come, uh, that, that the house is going to stand. Now, this morning, we're going to talk about some more adversity. We're going to, matter of fact, I'm calling this message Facing Adversity. We need to be able to face adversity as individuals as well as face adversity together uh, in our relationships and in marriage. Uh, let me just say this, if you're an individual that falls apart at every crisis, uh, let me tell you what, you're going to be on shaky ground going into a marriage. You, you need to learn to persevere and you need to learn to overcome adversity before you enter into a marriage relationship because how many of you know when you get married there's some adversity involved? Okay, I, between husbands and wives and just stuff you're going to face in life. So how are you going to handle it? And that's what we're going to look at. And we're going to look through the eyes of Mary and Joseph. But I want you to know this. Jesus said this in John 16 and 33. He said, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. And here on earth you're going to have many trials and sorrows. Uh, for, for a preacher to get into a pulpit and say, okay, you know, you come to Jesus today. You're going to not only be saved, but... Free, man. I mean, you're just going to be free. You're going to be restored, you know. Uh, you're going to be fulfilled in life, and, and everything's just going to be great. Well, that's not the true picture, is it? I mean, how many of you have suffered anything since you've become a Christian? How many of you have been under attack since you've been a Christian? How many of you have had trials? Oh, that's all of us, man. We all have. Uh, and Jesus said, you're going to have many trials and sorrows. That's why, I, that's why I just love the Word of God. It's honest. You know, he didn't hide anything from us. He didn't say, hey, y'all come in, and then we find out, oh, yeah, that was a part of it. He's telling us before we're going to have it. He said, but take heart. He said, because I've overcome the world. So we can, we can have peace, and we can take heart, because the one we are in and the one who is in us has already overcome. So therefore, we have a promise that we will overcome, but we will face the trials and the sorrows in life. And it comes in many different ways. You know, it can come in the form of uh, sickness. It can come in the form of betrayal. It can come in the form of abandonment or violation of trust. It can come in the form of financial challenges, personal loss, and the list could go on and on. You know, the truth is, uh, you would think that Mary and Joseph giving birth to the Son of God that they would have been exempt from this deal, right? Uh, that, that, you know, here, here they are going to, the, the incarnation, God in the flesh, she's going to give birth to it. You would think that they would have gotten a little bit of slack and not had to have faced what they had to face. But Mary had to face some stuff on her own. Joseph had to face some stuff on his own before they ever came together as a husband and wife, and we need to learn to do that. The Bible tells us this in Hebrews 4 and 15, that we have a high priest. Jesus, and I'm going to read this personally for me. I, I want to encourage you to read it personally for you. This high priest, Jesus of Hales, understands 
How's weakness? Jesus understands my humanity. He understands my flesh. Why? Because he left eternity, he took on our skin, and he dwelt among us. He lived among men. Why? He was fully God, but yet he was fully man. So he understands my humanity and my weakness. He faced all the same testing that Hal did and does. Yet did he, he did not sin. And that's the key. So Jesus came to identify with us. He was born into a tumultuous world, political chaos. You know, Jesus was born into poverty. We're going to see that today. He was born into lack when he came to the basic needs of life. Why did he do that? Why wasn't he born in some type of a palace? Because he came to identify with the human race. And to be honest with you, that's where most of the world is. You look at the world today. There are so many people born into this world under great adversity and they have nothing. We're, we're blessed among people. Jesus came to identify with the doubter, down and outer so they could identify with him. Jesus, like us, faced trials. Jesus was rejected. He was abandoned. He was betrayed. He was tempted by sin. He suffered the loss of people that he loved. He was hurt by false accusations. And he was treated unjustly by men. And the truth is, Jesus experienced physical pain and anguish on this earth. He faced a vicious devil in a harsh world, just like we do. But you know, all through it, he trusted his Father, right? So this morning, let's just get a little insight into facing some adversity. You know, last week we, we, we talked about uh, Moses, uh, Moses, Mary. <laughs> Mary, Moses, and Joseph, right? <laughs> we talked about Mary, uh, and, we, and we looked at Joseph, and uh, we said that they were engaged. And, of course, under the law uh, at that time, that if once that dowry was set and, and the engagement was on, they were considered by law to be legally married. But normally there was a waiting period of a year. Now, there's a reason that there was a waiting period. It's not like us. We go get the license and we jump into it. The, the, the reason there was a waiting period was to test their fidelity. Now, it was a man's world, right? Back then, it was a man's world. If Joseph would have cheated on Mary and gotten a woman pregnant, the, the engagement would have been off. Uh, he wouldn't have gotten his dowry back because he violated the law, but no one would have killed him. And you have Mary over there that, that if, if she were to get pregnant, what was going to happen to her? She'd be taken to the religious leaders, and they'd stone her to death. Now think about this, when she entered into this agreement, <clears throat> Mary's a young girl, but probably in her lifetime, Mary had probably witnessed a woman being stoned to death for this offense. It happened. And stoning was a slow, bloody death. So as this young girl enters into this arrangement, you know, she's not really concerned about that. We know that Mary was a virgin. She was, she was virtuous. She had opened her heart up to God. She had a right relationship with God. We know that. But yet, but yet the truth is when the Holy Spirit came to her and gave her this news that she would conceive a child by the Holy Spirit, she found herself in that, in that world Facing a capital offense. How many of you know that's adversity? Man, that, that's something tough for a young girl to have to face. So let's take a look at the scripture in Matthew 1 and 18. It said, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, you may not be, uh, you know, from the church. I, I was doing an article or reading an article, a blog by an archaeologist. It was, a, it was a woman done great research. She would written an article on Mary, and I thought it was fascinating. Matter of fact, I enjoyed it. She was going into great de detail of how she would have been raised in that culture, 
you know, what her parents would have been like, what she would have experienced. I mean, as I was reading this lady's re- report, I was thinking, man, this is just good stuff. But then when they got to the point of the virgin birth, she said, and we know that there was no virgin birth. That is impossible. Mary had sex with a man. So when I read that, I thought immediately, I said, well, this woman just, you know, doesn't believe in God. Because a God that can't do that is not a God. The God who spoke the world and the universe into existence, the Holy Spirit who hovered over the face of the earth, and God the Father said, this is my design. The word was spoken by Jesus, and the Holy Spirit brought it to pass. That same God could breathe into her womb and bring life. The virgin birth is not something to to me to even conceive as being hard to believe if you believe in God. (laughs) You believe that he's omnipotent, omniscient. The Holy Spirit, it said basically in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. And the seed of God's word was deposited into her womb and life took place. The hundred year or the 700 year prophecy of Isaiah was now fulfilled. And this faith filled girl now was getting ready to face some stuff, some trials of her own. The first question would be this to me. Where would she go and who would she tell? Think about it. Put yourself in her skin for a bit. She feels life in her womb. And she's probably thinking, because remember, Mary was human. I don't care what some people say about her. She was as human as I'm human. She was not some divine mother of God. She was a woman favorite of God that God used to bring the Messiah into the world. Mary was facing some stuff. Where would she go? Who would she go to? Number one, this, Mary would just trust God for her next step. You need to understand, church, that there are times that you're facing stuff, trials, sorrow, whatever it is in life. You don't need the big picture because God probably wouldn't show it to you even if you asked. All he's wanting is you to do is trust him one step at a time. Mary was faced. What do I, where do I go? What do I do? God, give me direction. And the Holy Spirit, you know, I believe it's a parent. He said, go to Aunt Elizabeth's house. Now, why go to Aunt Elizabeth's house? Why not to Mom? Why not to Dad? I'm going to address that in a minute. But why? I want you to understand something. I want you to take encouragement in this. When we face adversity, God always has someone to walk alongside us. Not only will He never leave us or forsake us, but He will have somebody to walk alongside us through that trial and that sorrow. That's the importance of community. You know, a lot of people, well, I really don't need community. Let me tell you, I'll be here 21 years in January, and the very people who say, I don't need the church and I don't need community, let me tell you what, when they get the bad report, guess who they contact? Pray for me. When they have a need, guess who they contact? They call community. I've said this a million times. You don't need a pastor until you need a pastor. People aren't going to need Jesus until they face him and need Jesus. People don't need the church until they need a church. Community is important because it's there when you get on a team and you serve, you start building relationships. So when that trial comes your way, you've got someone that can walk alongside you in it. You're involved in that small group while building relationships So so when that trial comes, you have people to walk alongside you. You have people that love you, care for you, will pray for you, will encourage you. That's why people need community. 
Mary would go to Elizabeth. Why Elizabeth? I believe because this Elizabeth was different, and you and I need to be different. See, I believe this. Elizabeth was someone Mary could trust and confide in. Can I ask you a question? Can you be trusted and confided in? Do you know we have to have people like that in the church? Matter of fact, every person in the church ought to be a person they can be trusted and confided in without saying a peep. Did you hear me? Yeah, but I got to tell my spouse, I just can't stand it. You can't be trusted. When a person looks at me and says, I'm going to say this in confidence, don't you dare breathe a word. It's the, it's, I ain't telling her. And it's not because she's not trustworthy. I'm just not going to tell her. Why? Because I gave my word. If you want people to be transparent and, and you want to pour into someone's life and help walk come up along, you've got to be trustworthy of being trusted. Mary, or Elizabeth was. Elizabeth was also a woman that was filled with the Holy Spirit. W women that are filled with the Spirit that have lived life, they ought to be mentors in the church to younger women. That's all Elizabeth was. She was an older, wiser woman that was filled with the Spirit, filled with the Word of God. And she came alongside Mary to encourage her, pray for her, and build her faith. There's so, there so many women that need those, that spiritual mom. Elizabeth was also one who would bless Mary, not condemn her. The church in the past has been full of condemnation, making people feel bad for what they've done. That's not the purpose of the church. The church is about redemption. And, for, and the next, Elizabeth was one who encouraged Mary in her faith. Let's look at the scripture in Luke 1 and 39. It said, a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea. She got out of town. To the town where Zechariah lived, she entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. And at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? And when I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. We see right here in this scripture a mature woman who would bless and not condemn. We see a mature woman who was filled with the Spirit, giving affirmation and encouraging Mary in her faith. And I want you to see this. That for 90 days, Mary stayed with Elizabeth to be, to be mothered, to be mentored, to be encouraged, and to be built. Everybody needs an Elizabeth in their life. And, and there's a lot of women out there that need to be Elizabeths to someone else. Why did Elizabeth pour into her? Because Mary had to go back and face mom and dad. Man, put yourself there. That 90 days, she needed that fresh air for 90 days. She, she needed to be poured into for 90 days because that time was coming to an end. Elizabeth was getting ready to give birth herself. And now Mary would have to go back and face mom and dad. So why didn't she go to mom and dad? Didn't the Holy Spirit direct her, just go to your mom and let her know, you know what, because your mom's going to understand. Your dad's going to get it. I got some red flags about the parents of Mary. Now this is conjecture, this is my opinion, and you can say, I don't agree with Pastor Hale concerning this, and that's cool with me because I could be absolutely wrong. Well, I just want to sh share just a perspective and how I sort of gained it. See, I believe this, that Mary's parents were religious, but not spiritual. Most of Israel was. 
See, most of Israel, they, 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 they could tell you, yeah, there's going to be a descendant of David. Yeah, the prophet said that. Yeah, he's going to come and he's going to set up a kingdom. Yeah, I know all that stuff. I've heard it. I've heard it for generations. But they weren't looking for him. Just like people in the church today. Yeah, I know Jesus is going to come back. Yeah, I've heard it forever. Yeah, it's the signs of the times. But we don't live like he's coming back. See a connection? They were religious. They weren't, they, they weren't anticipating a Messiah, expecting a Messiah. So, because they were religious, that brings me to my second point, they, they would not have believed them. You what? By whom? <laughs> what do you, you expect me to believe that? And if they didn't believe her, they would have condemned her, not blessed her. Now, another interesting thing when I look at her parents, they were never heard of again. Now, I know there's other people in the Bible that were mentioned and never heard of. But I think this is different. I'm just going to say this about, and my wife's not perfect by no means. Neither am I. That's why we're a pretty good fit. But I'm going to tell you this. When my daughters were pregnant with, with our grandchildren, she had crossed the doggone gates of hell to be with her daughters when they gave birth. She didn't care the place, the time, the journey. And Rebecca's last one, my gosh, I don't know how many times we took off to Richmond on a false alarm. We're out of the bed. Let's go. Always at night. Right as my eyes were shut. But I mean, nothing was going to stop my wife from being there and being with her daughter and sharing in that experience. Where was Mary's mom during this? Where was she in the upbringing of Jesus? Where was her dad? Because I promise you this. When mama went, I went. Right? So I've got to, I, I got to ask a question. Where were they? And then the last thing that to me convinces me is that Mary did not even get an invitation to stay at home. It was Joseph that had to go to Bethlehem in order to register for the census. Now think about it. This is an 80-mile journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem over a rocky terrain. Now I can just see my wife sitting there and her daughter saying, Hey, I'm going to go get on a donkey in my ninth month and I'm going to travel against this rock or over the rocky terrain in danger of possible robbers or wild animals. And mom said, okay, see ya. She said, absolutely not. You ain't going, hey, you ain't going nowhere. You're going to stay here. And I'm going to have the best midwives for you. And I'm going to be here with you. Joseph, you go, come back and get her. But she ain't going. Mary got on a donkey in her ninth month. And traveled with her husband. Why? Because her mom didn't want her. She was an embarrassment. She was pregnant. She violated the law. She brought shame on the family. And see, when we act like that as parents, you miss out on something special. They missed out on the birth of Christ and being involved in his life. That's messed up. Messed up. Now she faces mom and dad. Poor girl. Was it over? No, now she's 
got to deal with Joseph. Once again, put yourself in her skin. If you've ever been around a pregnant woman, they're emotional, aren't they? Hormones out of balance. And now she's going to face the man she loves and breaks his heart. Do you think, she, do you think that wasn't giving her some angst? How is he going to react, respond? Joseph, I'm sure, was brokenhearted. But as we saw last week, he was a man of compassion. And he decided not to take her before the authorities. He was going to give her grace and mercy. And then we know that the angel of the Lord intervened and said, Joseph, son of David, fear not to take Mary to be your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She's going to give birth to a son and call his name Jesus. And he's going to save his people from their sins. And notice what the Bible says that Joseph did. Let's go to the scripture. When Joseph woke up and did as the angel of the Lord uh, commanded, he took Mary to be his wife. So now we've got a woman that was able to face adversity, a man that was able to face adversity. People that had right vertical relationships, now they have a good horizontal relationship, all based on the promise of God, taking one step at a time together through the trials and the sorrows of life. See, that's what it takes. You would think at that point that they've passed the test. But Joseph, like Mary, he had trusted God, she trusted God, now they trust God together. Now they were going to start their journey to Bethlehem. 80 miles, I don't know how many days it took them. Five miles a day, 10 miles a day, I don't know. Long, hard trip. You can imagine what was going through her mind. God, don't let me birth on this donkey. God, don't let me birth on this donkey. God, don't let me birth on this donkey. And Joseph is praying in the spirit the whole way. God, don't let her have a baby on the donkey. Don't let her have a baby on the donkey. One step at a time, having to trust God. So they finally get to Bethlehem, right? They finally see civilization. They probably go, Phew, my gosh, I'm so glad to be here. And Joseph goes and stands in line and registers for the census. And he says, come on, honey. He said, let's go to the Marriott and check in. And there was no room at the Marriott. So they went to the Hilton. Hilton was booked that weekend. Then they went to the Comfort Inn. And there was no comfort to be found there. They even went where they just keep the light on, Motel 6. It was booked. You know that's bad. All the bed and breakfast. All of them booked. And what's going through their minds? Come on, Lord. What's next? We're trusting you. Just give us our next step. God came through. You know, and it's interesting how he came through. You know, they, they go to this, to this manger, to this barn. But it's not the barns that we see in the West, not in the pictures. If you've been around me for long enough, you know, th this, this manger that Jesus was born in was basically, it was stone that had been carved out. That's exactly how they made tombs. Now, isn't it interesting? This is, this is, I think this will preach sometime. That basically, Jesus, when he came to this earth and was born, he was born in a tomb. And then he was laid, laid to rest in the tomb. What does that signify? I believe it signifies this, that he, he, he was born into a sin-filled world and the wages of sin is death. That's how he came. Why? So he could save us from that death. So here, here Jesus, Mary, they're in, this, they're in this stall that smells like urine, manure, rotten hay, and animals. And Jesus was not born in some fluffy little manger. It was a feeding trough. Jesus came to this world in the most adverse of circumstances. Why? So he could identify with 
you and me, so you and I could identify with him. He knows our weakness. He knows our suffering. He knows our trials. He knows our temptations. Mary and Joseph just had to trust God. You would have thought that that was enough, but it wasn't. There was much more that they would face. They would flee to Egypt as refugees. Most scholars believe that Joseph died when Jesus was a teenager, so Jesus knows what it is to lose a father at a very young age at a pivotal time of his life. You would say, well, that's not his real father. Well, it was his stepdad. That's all he knew on this earth. He loved his dad, I'm sure. Now Mary is a single mom faced with raising Jesus. See, trial after trial after trial, and then Mary one day has to see her son brutalized, tortured, and hung on a cross for something he didn't commit. How do people get through that? How do families survive that? It's, a, it's simplistic, but it's true. You have to trust God for each step. When Jesus was born, I'm sure that Mary and Joseph, when they, when they gazed on his beauty, gazed on his face, everything that they had suffered, it probably left. It dissipated for the joy of the of that fulfillment of God's promise in Christ. Psalms 35 says this, Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. See, through everything they suffered and endured, there was a purpose. Let's go to the last scripture. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it as an opportunity for great joy. Now, why? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. God's doing something in you. When you face tests and trials, God's doing something in you. He's growing you. Why? Why, why does God do that? Why? why? Because you know what? Your testimony is important. I go back to Elizabeth. The church needs more Elizabeth, not just women, but men. That you can have somebody that, hey, I've gone through that. I, I know what you're suffering. I felt your pain. And I'm going to walk with you through that. God got me through it. He may not get you through it the same way, but he'll get you through it. And I want to be here with you and walk with you in it. See, we can rejoice that God is working in us. He's doing something that ultimately is going to bring glory to him. He said, let it grow. When your endurance is fully developed, he said, you're going to be what? Perfect. You're going to be, you're going to be complete. You're going to be, you're going to be mature. And you're not going to need a thing because I'm going to get you through it. So what, is, what are the steps? What are our steps? Number one, we want to trust God for each step. Whatever you're going through, trust him for each step. Don't, don't ask him for the end result. Just trust him. God, what's my next step? Number two, you've got to gain perspective when you're in the midst of a, of a fight. Gain some perspective. Say, God, what are you doing in this? Examine me. How are you going to use this in my life? Understand, God is do, using sometimes pain to give us a great, greater purpose. And then three, you need to find joy amid adversity. 
Don't focus on the adversity. Find joy in it. Knowing that God's going to bring you through and you're going to be, you're going to be stronger. You're going to be a better person as a result. I love what C.S. Lewis said. He said, hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. And I modified that a little bit for families. Hardships in our families prepare ordinary families for extraordinary destinies. God wants to use you. He wants to use your family. You may be going through a struggle. You may be going through a a trial right now. Matter of fact, you may be considering breaking up and divorce because of the trials. But I want you to know God sees you, and if you trust him in it, he'll heal, he'll restore. And it takes work. And you can gain perspective that God's going to use you to bless someone else because of your testimony. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you just stand, everybody would stand at this time. I just want to extend an invitation. This morning, if you don't know Jesus, I want you to know that Jesus came for you. He died for you. And he was raised that you can have life. And he said, I'll never leave you, forsake you, and he won't. He'll be right there with you every step of the way. I want you to know that God loves you too much to let you stay where you are. And if that's you this morning and you feel God working in your heart, this isn't about joining a a church. It's about accepting Christ, entering into a relationship with him and, and being a part of the great church, the body of Christ. This is not about religion. It's about a personal relationship. And it's not about being good enough, for none of us are. That's why we need grace. And if that's you today, I'm going to count to three. I just want you to lift your hand. I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. I just want to see your hand. One, don't be afraid. Two, just be obedient. Three, just lift your hand. Is there one? in here today. God, we thank you for such great grace. We thank you for the promises that our lives are built. And Lord, we thank you for communion, that we can take it. That as we eat the bread, we are partaking of the body. As we drink, Lord, the juice, Lord, it represents your blood, the work of redemption. And Lord, as we take today, may we be grateful and thankful. I'm going to ask my prayer people to come forward today. You may may have a need. You may be facing something in your life. You may be facing something as a couple, as a family. You may be facing something individually. And I'm going to ask you to step out and come and receive prayer this morning. It's a step of faith. You don't have to share with them anything other than the fact that I'm going through something and I want agreement, and they're going to agree with you, pray with you, and believe God with you. And I'm going to ask the rest of you, who who will? You know, next week is a big, big week, 725 names. I would like you to come forward and just come to the altar and take a couple of those cards and just just begin to, to pray for them and pray for the ones that you're going to invite. Because we're believing God to do something great here next week. So at this time, we just ask you to step out to receive communion. You can receive prayer or come up and pray for these people who need Jesus.